Okay, so you are serious about studying computer science in one of the best universities in the world. You've researched the place well, you've prepared for the interview, you've done your homework, but you still got plenty of questions. So one thing that I was curious about, um, one of the things I was wondering about, another thing I was wondering about, Welcome to Frank Stajano Explains. I'm professor at the Department of Computer Science and Technology at the University of Cambridge, and today you get to ask me your questions. More precisely, one of you gets to ask me her questions about this place live. She has been through the Cambridge admissions process, she received an offer to read Computer Science at Trinity, and she took advantage of that to come and visit the place in person to see what it's like. And it's a very good idea, and I recommend all offer holders do that, especially those of you who had their interview online because of COVID. Since she came all the way from America, and she had already been on the channel before through video link, see her rather popular videos up there, then we decided to do another question and answer session, but this time in reverse, with me answering questions instead of asking them. This is all totally unscripted, and she asked me whatever she felt like without giving me her questions in advance. Natalie Schall. Hello, Natalie. I'm very happy that Hi. you're here to Cambridge to see the thing for yourself. It's been so great to meet you. I've loved meeting all of the Trinity students, um, and I got to walk around campus with Anna Dolliner, who is currently a third-year student at, um, at Trinity, and it's been absolutely amazing. I'd love to ask you a few more questions. Absolutely. I'm not yours. Um, so first of all, for a Komsky student, what are some of the main topics that are covered in first year? Uh, the way that we arrange the course, the undergraduate uh, computer science course, is that in the first year you have uh, a very constrained menu and you don't get to choose stuff. You're going to uh, be introduced to programming because you accept people with no programming experience. Just mm -hmm. aptitude to computing but no programming experience is good for us. Mm -hmm. uh, it's okay if you're a very experienced programmer. Uh, international uh, informatics Olympiad and so on. It's also good for us. And to kind of even the field, we introduce you to programming with something that you probably haven't seen before, even if you are an experienced mm -hmm. programmer, which is a functional language called OCAM. Mm -hmm. So that kind of puts the experts off their perch <laughs> and uh, introduces you to a more mathematically oriented way to think about programming. Uh, and is a is a more even playing field because it's new for basically everyone. I see. Uh, and then besides that, uh, there's also some uh, more traditional imperative object-oriented programming, uh, which is currently taught using the Java language, which would be familiar to all the ones who've already done some programming. Um, and then there's uh, more you know, theory foundations about discrete mathematics and uh, algorithms uh, and databases and well, all sorts of you know, graphics and all sorts of things. So but these are courses where you don't get to choose. Yes. We have chosen a menu for you of things mm -hmm. that are sensible to do in the first year and you do not. Then in the second year there are uh, many more courses and um, you're still supposed to do all the things we tell you but in fact you have some choice in which ones you answer exam questions for. Mm -hmm. in the sense that at the end of the year, in the, at the end of the first year, you have to answer questions on all the things that we told you you had to go to lectures on. Whereas in the, uh, at the end of the second year, in the exam, you have to answer questions on a subset that you choose mm -hmm. of the courses that you could take. I mean, you, you, had, you had to take all these courses, but if you're really not interested in the theory side of computing, but more you know, the hardware, electronics, and so mm -hmm. on, and you can decide, I'm going to answer uh, questions on this other aspect. And you can't arbitrarily choose which course you just dump something all together. But uh, there's a bit of a leeway in, you know, I'm going to do less of this and more of that. Mm -hmm. And in the third year, there's a lot more freedom. There's many more, cho many more choices of courses than you could reasonably go to in a mm -hmm. year. Uh, and you decide uh, even which lectures to attend. And of course, do the exams uh, according. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, um, Anna told me a bit about that. She mentioned she's only has to take five questions out of fifteen that are going to be on her exam. Another thing I was wondering about is you mentioned Okama. I'm wondering, do students review that over the summer before the start of the course? And what programming language do you think it's the most similar to? Out of the more well-known ones. 
So before introducing a calendar one or two years ago, we had a, a language called uh, ML, which stands for Meta Language uh, Standard ML. Mm -hmm. um, was developed by Robin Milner, who used to be head of department for us uh, a few years ago, like about 20 years ago. Uh, he is dead now, but uh, he, he was one of the uh, founders of this you know, rigorous way of thinking about programming in a more mathematical way, such that you could then prove properties of programs. Uh, and so ML is something that, if I had to say what's it similar to that people might have heard of, uh, at the stretch, I might say Lisp. I see. Okay, something where you can uh, define a function as something that you can then pass around and manipulate. Uh, and um, there's a much more strict definition of what the programming constructs do uh, than happens in imperative programming. Uh, and things are much more constrained and the, we try to avoid having side effects um, in a functional language and giving people a glimpse of functional programming at the start of their computing career is educational because it, 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 it turns your brain on to new ways of thinking about programming than just you know hacking stuff and hoping that it works <laughs> makes sense that sounds like a really exciting opportunity. Another thing I was wondering about is... Have you programmed in Lisp or any other functional language before? Yes, so oh, no. I um, I started the American Computer Science League club at my school, and we compete in the American Computer Science League, and one of the topics covered in one of the later competitions actually is Lisp, and you have to evaluate some code in Lisp, so I have worked with it. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I was wondering about is practicals. I talked a little bit about them, but I was hoping I could maybe hear from you about what some of the practicals entail and what you think are perhaps the most fun and exciting parts. Yes, um, I think it would be uh, shameful for someone to get a degree in computer science from the University of Cambridge uh, mm -hmm. and be able to talk the talk and hand wave about stuff, but not being able to program. Right. So. Uh, I feel very strongly that everybody who gets through our course must be able to program. I mean, it doesn't mean that you have to become a full-time coder at the end of this degree. You can go into other things which are, you know, use your competence in computing for doing high-level things, uh, but you have to have a core competence about programming. So, um, for that, we uh, we introduce a variety of practical exercises, some of which are optional, some of which are just at the discretion of the uh, course lecture, mm -hmm. and some others are instead something that we expect everybody to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, there are some which involve an assignment and some deadline, and by the deadline you have to have submitted the assignment, and some of them are automatically checked by mm -hmm. uh, uh, a program that sits behind the submission server. So you submit your thing and it, it turns away and it says mm, that doesn't work because it crashes on this test input. And then you say, okay, right, and let me resubmit. And you can resubmit until the deadline. Uh, and uh, some others are more elaborate, some others uh, may be a, a project that you do uh, with your colleagues. In the second year, there's a, a, a project that's done in groups of six people. Mm -hmm. um, in the third year, there's a project that basically takes the whole year and then you write a dissertation about it. Mm -hmm. um, and so these, of course, are uh, somewhat more complex than just uh, uh, practical exercises. Right. Um, the supervisor, you, you were aware of the fact that Cambridge does supervisions as well yes. as the lectures. The supervisor may set you some problems which then are local to the group of people that are supervised by that person and may be different for other people on the same course. I see. Uh, and the beauty of the supervision system is that it can be tailored to uh, your own level and your own skills and your own weaknesses and says, well, you, are, you seem to be very good on this, so we don't need to worry about making you do another exercise on that because you already know it backwards and forwards, but actually you seem to be slightly uh, weak on that aspect, let me make you do some work on that and then we can talk about it next time we meet. I see. 
So one thing that I was curious about is you brought up just now the projects that students work on. <clears throat> And I heard that students get to work for companies and to help develop an actual product. Could you maybe give a few examples of some of the great products that students have worked on over the years? Uh, I am not very uh, closely involved with uh, second year projects, so I don't have uh, I don't have ready to mind uh, examples of uh, things that I would. Uh, that I would impress you with. Uh, but yes, we do offer companies the opportunity to pretend to be the client on <laughs> some... Um, I mean, it, it, it's all slightly gamified in that, of course, it's not a, a production team. It's, uh, the, the, mm. the six people play uh, the game of there's this person who is our client and we have meetings mm -hmm. with the client and the client says what they want and then we try to... Uh, meet the requirements, but then you know they're all competitively evaluated at the end, you know, not for marks, but you know there's a kind of league table of who gets the most vote <laughs> by the audience at the end, and so you naturally want to uh, want to do well. And if you if you you know if you're one of the top three uh, projects, then you can put this as a CP item. So mm -hmm. in, in that sense, you know everybody wants to be uh, doing well. And some uh, so these companies, uh, where do these companies come from? We have uh, um, lots of connections with industry in here, uh, not least because uh, a number of uh, graduates from the computer lab uh, went on to um, start companies. That's right. I saw actually when I was at the computer lab, I saw a whole list of some of the successful companies that students from Trinity um, and Cambridge have started. And the list was huge. And there's actually a couple companies that I recognize, like Raspberry Pi. So it was super exciting to see. Yes. Well, I hope if you, if you read the whole names, you recognize plenty more. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, so um, these. Uh, connections with industry. I mean, they don't have to have started uh, at the computer lab, but uh, we have plenty of connections. And even if they haven't started the computer lab, they are quite keen to recruit people who come out of the computer lab. So uh, one of the ways we engage them is we have a kind of uh, careers fair uh, yearly mm -hmm. where they can all have stalls and entice people to come for internships and so on and so on. Uh, and another way is to say, well, you can engage with our students while they're still doing the degree by suggesting a project. It has to be a project of the right size for them to finish in a year in a group of six. Uh, and that gives some kind of um, glimpse of what it's like to do something which has uh, users and uh, people who might use it or might not use it if it's not that good. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah. Um, for for the companies, I mean, they can just suggest something and hope that someone makes uh, makes what they they envisage. But it usually never is something that's usable after the project finishes. It, it would right. always need to be uh, you know, redone, polished, and so on and so on. But right. it, it's just. It's about the process, it's not about the, the end product. Uh, and uh, the most useful thing that would come out of this is this interaction of them learning how to meet the requirements of the client. I see. I've learned that the longer I make a video and the fewer people watch it to the end. So let me stop this here for today, but join us in this other video for the continuation of this reverse interview. Thank you very much for watching, and if you found this interesting, then like, subscribe, and you'll find plenty more material about getting into Cambridge on this playlist over here. See you in the next video.